At 8:39 a.m. on Wednesday, November the 18th, 2009, a distraught father in Western Sydney called Triple O. Ambulance emergency. What's the problem? Tell me exactly what's happened. Attempted suicide. My son has stuck a knife in his chest. He's lost a lot of blood. He's um, got a pain to the lung, I think. And he's, he's in a bad way. At 8.51 a.m., as an ambulance arrived at the scene, police radio issued a call for cars to assist. Public County Scouting Centre County vicinity for a self-harm incident. Wanji Road at Lakemba, across Lakemba Street. A uh, 35-year-old male with a self-inflicted stab wound to the chest. At two minutes past nine, an officer at the house called for backup. Yeah, Kim's gone for urgent further police to this location, please. Cover that. Something had gone badly wrong, as police and ambulance officers separately reported. So we've had shots fired from Camp 14, shots fired. I just can't make away ASAP. Camp 10, thanks. Uh, incident at Lakemba, uh, self-inflicted stab wound, uh, now it appears that the police may have shot the patient. The man with the knife was 36-year-old Adam Salter, and he died not from self-inflicted stab wounds, but from a police bullet. It's a death that should never have happened. For the first 35 years of his life, Adam Salter showed no sign of mental illness. I guess what I'd have to say about Adam is that he was um, a normal kid growing up. He was a 100% um, mischievous little boy, bright, inquisitive. Um, he looked after his young brother and sister. Um, they always looked up to him. Yeah, he was my big brother. I loved him very much. Um, and I miss him a lot. Um, Adam had an incredible sense of love and kindness and compassion for others. He, he embraced anyone that, you know, that came into his, his life. Adam Salter had a passion for the outdoors, with the challenges it brought and the demands it put on him physically. He was a rock climber and really fit and agile and uh, he wanted to keep it that way. But tragically, although his body was fit, his mental state suddenly unravelled. In July 2008, devastated by the breakup of his own marriage and his parents' decision to split up, Adam Salter suffered a psychotic episode. His bizarre behaviour shocked and alarmed his family. He was starting to say some strange, some of these strange things and saying that, you know, um, he thought he was a prophet of God and had all these divine inspiration and, and things, and I thought, no, Adam. I remember him coming home and saying to me, Dad, have you noticed a lot of pea plates on cars? There seem to be everywhere, pea plates. And I thought, well, that's a bit funny, but no, I haven't noticed them particularly, you know, more than usual. And the, the, um, I think it was the next morning he, he went out and started removing pea plates from cars and he believed he was um, a messenger of God and that P stood for promiscuous. Um, and someone punched him out. When the police intervened, they found Adam Salter wandering in traffic and realising he was unwell, took him to hospital. In that case, the police were very kind and gentle and helped him. Adam Salter was admitted to Concord's Centre for Mental Health, where he was diagnosed with psychosis and made an involuntary patient. It's quite clear from the history of this case, including the period of involuntary treatment, that the case was extremely serious. That's like going to intensive care. 
in other aspects of the medical system. That's like requiring very specialised care for cancer. The implications of that are not just for the short term, they're very much for the longer term care. When he left hospital after three weeks, Adam Salter was prescribed antipsychotic medication and his care was handed over to his GP and the local community mental health team. Now, it would have been probably three months later when I realised that, that nothing was happening, that I phoned Canterbury Mental Health Services and asked what was going on and um, explained and the man I spoke to said, oh yes, uh, Adam Salter, we have to do something about that. We will follow it up. One of Australia's most prominent psychiatrists says that with proper specialist care, Adam Salter's eventual relapse might have been averted. We don't say to parents of children with leukaemia, go to your GP and sort out the next years of next five years of chemotherapy. We take responsibility in the specialist systems for the complex situations where we have the skills and the knowledge and understanding of the behavioural risks. So in this case, as in many other cases, when care breaks down, the risk of a tragic outcome is significantly increased. In Adam Salter's case, the risk was compounded by his own resistance to the idea that he was mentally ill. I think he was really embarrassed about the fact that he was suffering from a mental illness. I think he thought, you know, I'm fine. I'm fine. What happened then was just a, a strange time. And I'm probably he believed that it was a one-off as well. <laughs> Adam Salter believed he was better and his career was taking off. When someone builds a website, in early 2009, his remarkable skills as a software developer were recognised by a creative online company which hired him. Adam stood out as somebody that was innovative and on the very edge of emerging technology. Using his considerable programming skills, Adam Salter transformed the popular music subscription service Kazaa into a commercial success. Adam drove that. That was the project he was working on. That, you know, was the... I would say that would be the high point of his career. Hi, everybody. Um, <laughs> for those of you who don't know me, uh, I'm Adam. I'm the elder brother of... Uh, Adam Salter was on a roll, and in April 2009, he travelled to Perth for his sister Zarine's wedding. He seemed to be doing really well. Yeah, he was happy. And at the wedding, he just seemed to be, yeah, really, really good, stable. Um, he gave a great speech, cracked a few jokes, <laughs> tried to take responsibility for getting us together. <laughs> Apparently, he told me that I, I said to him that um, my sister was free. And, I thought, <laughs> <laughs> and that's what got him thinking. He came back to Perth and he's like, wait a second, he's looking pretty good. <laughs> But seven months later, the pressures were piling up. Adam was thinking more about his marriage. He, um, not long before that, received final notice of the divorce. So the divorce certificate came through. Um, he... It was coming up towards the anniversary of his wedding. And the build-up at work was that, that there was a lot of pressure on him at work. Suddenly, his mental condition plummeted. Feeling stressed, he saw his GP, who prescribed him an antidepressant and advised him to visit a psychiatrist. When he went to work that day, his colleagues were horrified. He didn't make eye contact. He wasn't hungry. He was searching for himself. Couldn't concentrate. So he was kind of like a small piece of the atom that was there the week before. 
So that I've never seen anybody spiral so quickly. He seemed to be choked. And he was fighting it. That night, when he returned home, Adam Salter's father, Adrian, became seriously concerned. I said, hi, Adam, and he didn't respond. And um, I um, said hi again, and he didn't respond. And I looked up, and he was standing in the one spot. And he didn't seem to be hearing me. Um, and I became concerned then. So I went in and um, phoned a friend um, who was a psychiatrist and asked what I should do and, and she advised that I take him to hospital. She said, that's not, that sounds serious, take him to hospital. What's clear in this case, as in many cases, is the situation went from relatively stable to unstable very quickly. This situation deteriorated over 24, 48 hours. All there is is a GP response. All there is is a suggestion of getting others involved. I think others gave the correct advice. This person needs to get to a hospital. I resolved to do that, but as soon as I hung up the phone, Adam came walking in and seemed OK. Um, he said, I, I, I'll go in the morning. I don't, I'd like to stay in my own bed tonight. and I've, I'm, I'm OK now. I'm, I'm fine. And so I didn't push the matter. I didn't push it. Um, in hindsight, obviously, I should have. At 7am on Wednesday, November the 18th, Adrian Salter and his son spoke at breakfast. Adam had been given a pamphlet by his GP with a number on it for psychological services. After breakfast, Adrian went into his office to call the number. While I was doing that, I heard Adam, I heard the sounds from the other room, a sort of cough and gargle, um, which was a, you know, a, a, just sounded wrong. And I went out and Adam was putting a knife in his chest. And um, that was just a total shock. That, uh, um, and I said, Adam, what are you doing? Please don't do this. There's no need for this. Adam, please don't. And Adam, Adam said, I have to do it. I have to, and I said, no, Adam, you don't have to. And, and uh, during this time, I was trying to take the knife away from him, and of course, he's stronger than me and bigger. But, and, and there was a bit of a struggle, and he said, I don't want to hurt you. So I said, Adam, what you're doing is hurting me. The, your actions are hurting me. This is... Very, this is hurting me a lot. Please, please stop. And and he did then. When I said that, he allowed me to take the knife. And I held him and and I took him in back into the kitchen and threw the knife in the sink. Um, and sat him on the floor with his back against the cupboard and called Triple O. Ambulance emergency, what's the address we're going to? 1G Road, W-A-N-G-E-E. -E. Yep. Lakemba, L-A-K-E-M-B-A. -E and what's the problem? Tell me exactly what's happened. Attempted suicide. My son has stuck a knife in his chest. He's lost a lot of blood. He's um, got a puncture the lung, I think. His breathing is... And he's, he's in a bad way. After calling Triple O, Adrian Salter wedged the front door open with a brick. When I went back, Adam had stood up and he was sort of moving towards the sink where the knife was. 
and, and I put my arms around him and I said, Adam, come on, sit down again. Uh, and, but he, he seemed to have trouble sitting down. His knees were shaking and, and I, I helped him down. I said, Adam, just let me support you and, and go down, uh, which I did. And I had a cushion I put behind him. Um, and I just held him there, waiting for the ambulance. Um, and he reached up and hugged me and we were sort of... That was a... Um... <coughs> it's, it's funny to say it was a very special moment when Adam was hugging me and, and I was holding him. Uh, I, uh, sorry. And I thought he was going to be okay. I thought, this is, the ambulance is coming. Adam will be okay. At 8.51 a.m., the first paramedics arrived. When the Ambos came in and they took over, they clearly knew what they were doing and I thought, well, my son's in safe hands. But when the police arrived four minutes later, the mood changed. Someone put me in the front room and said, stay in there. I'd put my head out around the corner and, and have a look to see what was, see how Adam was. So, and then they, they'd tell me, get back in that room. Quite, someone, quite forcefully, get back in that room. It's very typical in emergency services and other situations to make a fundamental error which is to assume to clear the scene of the people who may be able to best communicate with the person in this situation. This is where training and understanding and experience matters. Anyone who's worked in the mental health area would understand that what you need are people who are familiar and potentially not threatening, potentially not in uniform, potentially not escalating the situation. People do not understand the extent to which a person in this situation will misinterpret, is already scared, is already terrified of what is happening. At 8.57 a.m., two more police officers arrived at the house and the mood deteriorated further. Well, they treated the place like it was a bloody crime scene, it was as if, as if there was some criminal, and I thought, well, they're treating me like a criminal, and... and um, What's, what's happening here? No crime had been committed, but the police deliberately left the knife in the sink as if it were a crime scene. Adam Salter was on the kitchen floor nearby being treated by the paramedics. Suddenly, he rose to his feet and moved towards the sink. Seeing this, his father Adrian rushed into the kitchen to try and stop him reaching the knife. He pushed me aside and I fell over and got tangled in the leads from, from some of the equipment. And then he picked up the knife and started stabbing himself in the neck. And then I heard, I was still getting up from where I tangled on the floor and I heard shouting and I heard someone say, Taser, Taser. <sighs> Taser, taser, taser. And then I heard a bang, a loud bang. And Adam fell over backwards and I thought, I, f I thought, thank God he's been tasered and he'll be all right. Tragically, Adrian Salter was wrong on both counts. Far from being tasered, Adam Salter had been shot in the back with a bullet that pierced his heart. Incident at Lakemba, uh, self-inflicted stab wound. Uh, now it appears that the police may have shot the patient. So I just want to confirm who I tried to get the knife and was shot by police. Is that correct? Got the knife ready. Got the knife and was coming at us. <laughs> In the chaos that followed the shooting of Adam Salter, his father Adrian was taken to hospital suffering from shock. 
It was a different hospital to the one his son had been taken to, and for hours no one gave him news of his son. I heard a nurse, nurses talking outside the room. One of them was coming in to check my blood pressure again, and someone said to her, this is the man whose son was shot and killed by police. And when the nurse came in, I said, look, I couldn't help hearing. I heard what was said outside. She said, nothing was said. You know, and this was going on. And, and I said, look, I heard it. I, I know that someone said that my son Adam was shot and killed. Is that true? Just tell me because that's what I heard. And she rushed out. She didn't say anything. She just rushed out. And about, I don't know, three or four minutes, five minutes later, the detective came in and told me and said that Adam was dead. Adrian Salter and his family are horrified by the way he was isolated following the shooting. It seems completely bizarre to me as, as the father of someone that they've just shot dead. More detectives then came to the hospital. They said, we have to take your clothes because there was blood on my clothes. So they took my clothes, leaving me naked, um, and I was given a hospital gown to wrap up in. Shortly afterwards, Adrian Salter was taken to a police station and subjected to a lengthy interview. All this time, my family is waiting. They didn't know where I was. They didn't know what was happening. Um, but this interview went on until six o'clock at night. So here... And Adam died at nine o'clock in the morning. Um, thinking about it, it's bizarre. Thinking about it, 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 it just, it beggars belief. I can't understand the process. All I can think is the police did not care one bit about me or about my family or about Adam all they cared about was their own procedure, to follow their procedure and get things right for them. There's a culture of uh, protection and a culture of support, and you see this in every single report that um, the police issue about a critical incident. The first thing that the person in charge of an incident will be worried about is the welfare of the police involved. They're not concerned about the person that they've killed. They're not concerned about that person's family. Instead, it's the welfare of police officers. You see that again and again and again. In the hours that followed the shooting, the police insisted that the use of lethal force against Adam Salter had been justified, and the media reported this. We believe he has grabbed a knife from the kitchen and confronted police. During that confrontation, that male has been shot once by police. In its report to the coroner the same day, the police claimed that Adam Salter was challenged several times by police to drop the knife, refusing to do so. The deceased lunged the knife at police. That was patently false. And indeed, um, during the course of the inquest, I asked some questions of the officer who was, the police officer who was assisting the coroner, um, Officer O'Gorman. Virginia Gorman, and she conceded that it was untrue. Stephen Rushton represented Adam Salter's family at the inquest, challenging the police's version of what had happened. From that point on, the whole investigation focused and the way it was presented to the outside world through the media uh, in terms of uh, a mentally ill man who had uh, threatened the police and given them no alternative but to shoot him. In the critical first 24 hours following the shooting, a succession of false situation reports from senior officers went up the line to the police commissioner. 
On Talkback Radio the next day, Commissioner Andrew Scipioni pledged his support to the officer who'd pulled the trigger. We've got seven or eight people there. We've got two ambos. We've got four-year officers. We've got the, the victim. Um, and we've got the victim's father all in this small area. And it's portrayed to me today by officers that he's lunging a knife at one of those six or seven people. I mean, I'm buggered if I know, Commissioner, what your officers are supposed to do. I mean, the civil libertarians are saying, get the taser out. I mean, you've got a fraction of a second and there's a knife at your throat. What do you do? Right. You know what you do? You rely on the experience of a very senior officer who's got 21 years on patrol to make the right call. Just quickly, Sheree, are you right or left-handed with the shooting? Right. Have you washed your hands since the incident? Um, no, I haven't seen. The officer who made the call to use her firearm was Sergeant Cherie Bissett. She chose not to use her baton, handcuffs, capsicum spray or taser. Sergeant Bissett had left her most junior colleague, probationary constable Aaron Abella, to keep an eye on Adam Salter in the kitchen. And he's still connected to our ECG monitor. So in their filmed police interviews, the paramedics gave vivid accounts of what happened when Adam Salter reared up and moved towards the sink. I don't know whether he was intentionally making his way to the sink, but that's where he sort of he got to the sink and then grabbed the knife mm. and then started stabbing himself in the throat. From where I could see, he held it like that, yes. and he's just gone in his neck like this. OK, which hand did he use? Crucially, none of the paramedics said they felt their lives were in danger. Like, it was a threatening, dangerous situation, yeah. but I think, I think that... I don't, I think he was just intent on hurting himself. Yeah. I don't think that he was trying to hurt anyone else there. Um, like, I didn't want to get anywhere near the guy yeah. with a, a knife like that, but I think he was just more intent on getting that knife and just sinking it into himself rather than actually hurting anyone. I lead the investigation team into the uh, fatal shooting of a man named Adam Salter. In walkthroughs filmed 12 days after the event, Sergeant Bissett and Probationary Constable Abella gave graphic descriptions of how Adam Salter was shot. As, as he got up, yeah. I've gone to grab him first to sort of push him back, yeah, yeah. but then I've gone for his left, gone to get his, get his left arm. OK, yeah, so what's happened so then? So I've pulled him and he's, he was very aggressive. I couldn't, I couldn't pull him back. I was okay. just doing all I could. He's made it, obviously, with two steps towards that sink area. Okay. I was concentrating on him, just using all my energy to, to okay. pull him back. And obviously, my hands were also sliding with the blood that was on his arms. OK. You initially told that a man... Constable Abella's account was flatly contradicted by the senior paramedic treating Adam Salter. She said he didn't move from his original position by the refrigerator. Okay. Uh, there was only one police officer in the room at that stage. Um, he, in, I believe, responded slowly. He was trying to put his gloves on rather than apprehend the patient. Everybody else who was in the room did not see him move um, away from the refrigerator, which was away from the sink, and where he had been standing um, since he arrived at so, the scene. So in your judgment and in the judgment of the coroner, was his account truthful? No, oh, it, it can't be. It can't be, and, and, and indeed the coroner so found. When Constable Abella failed to act, the paramedics called for help. I have yelled for the police outside to come in, come in, um, with a few more expletives than that. And then the police have raced in. I've seen a female officer uh, with a weapon drawn, yelling, taser, taser, taser. Um, I've seen the other male police officer jump out of the way of the patient, and then a loud bang. It wasn't like he sort of lunged at anyone or did anything like that. It was almost like he was stabbing, stabbing, bang, and then down. The purpose of our interview here today is to uh, interview Sergeant Cherie Bissett from Campsie. And we also have... Uh, In her own filmed Adam evidence, Salter. Sergeant Bissett claimed she fired at Adam Salter because Constable Abella's life was in danger. I saw them struggling. Yeah. He's got the knife in his hand. Um, I thought about going in and grabbing the other side, mm -hmm. but then I said, no, it's too dangerous. Um, dangerous for who? For yourself? For the other or anyone else present? Dangerous for me and yeah. anyone present. Okay. Um, so I've just drawn my gun, gone taser, 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 and at that stage he's gone, he's turned like that, 
Um, and Aaron, I'm going to spit more around. Like, sort of like that. Bit in. Like your body's, yeah, like that. Um, and so I shot him here. Okay. Is there any reason why you, you yelled taser? They, they were the words that just came That's out of my good. mouth. Um, well, it's certainly not the case you pull out and go, gun, 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 do you? No. No. Constable Bella was smaller than the man? Yeah, yeah. Um, and he, at that stage, had, had swung around towards him, so I thought he was going to stab him and kill him. OK. At Adam Salter's inquest, the coroner praised his father, Adrian Salter, as a most impressive witness, truthful and candid. Was Adam attacking Constable Abella? No. Constable Abella was off to one side, nowhere near Adam. So was Adam struggling with Constable Abella? No. The most damning evidence that Sergeant Bissett's account of what occurred was untrue came from the clothes that Constable Abella was wearing on the day. Now, one would have um, uh, expected, having regarded the amount of blood which was on um, Adam's body through self-harm, that if there had been this close contact that Bissett claimed there had been just before she fired the shot, he would have been covered in blood. You look at his shirt, and there are some specks down the back, nothing on the front, N not, not a bit. Um, and that's uh, inexplicable if what... Uh, uh, Pissett was saying uh, during her interview uh, was correct. Her account and the account of um, some of the other officers is at complete odds with the evidence given by the um, paramedics and uh, indeed Adam's father, Adrian. So in your view and in the view of the coroner, was her account truthful? No, it wasn't truthful. You've got to a point there when you realise, in, in your mind, there's some danger. This walk-through interview with Sergeant Bissett formed a key part of the investigation into Adam Salter's death, carried out for the coroner by homicide squad detectives. Last year, Sergeant Bissett applied unsuccessfully to stop the ABC broadcasting this footage. But the walk-through itself, conducted by the head investigator, Detective Inspector Russell Oxford, was criticised by the coroner as a deeply flawed process. Yep. And words were put into a mouth. At the time the walk-through was conducted with Detective Inspector Oxford, he was aware that her version of events was at odds with a number of other witnesses, the ambulance officers and Adrian Salter. None of that was put to her. None of it was raised with her. Uh, rather, uh, he gave the appearance of trying to assist her to come up with reasons why um, what she was saying was credible. So to put it crudely, he was on her side. Absolutely. And, 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 and in any fair-minded observer of that interview would come to that view. The fact that you said taser, taser, taser is merely a warning to others that yep. you're intending to use a taser. Yeah. And as I said, when you produce your, your firearm, you don't yell out gun, 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 do you? No. So it could it be the case that by simply giving some in the, in the, in the I suppose, in the, uh, the timing of all this, it was very traumatic, a very uh, emotionally charged type of incident. You're trying to give some warning to police officers here that you're about to take some action. Yeah. The first thing you thought of was taser, taser, yeah. taser. Yeah. Okay. At least because you couldn't think of, well, I'll pull my gun out, what do I say? Yeah. Is that right? Yeah. And see, so we just, once you've taser, 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 and then you fired the shot. Yep. Yeah. Okay. In his final report for the coroner, Detective Inspector Oxford concluded that Sergeant Bissett was reasonable in her belief that Constable Abella was at immediate risk of death or serious harm. What's your reaction to that conclusion? It's a joke. It's a joke. It's entirely uh, inconsistent with the version of events given by all, uh, except the officers who were involved. Uh, it's nonsense. And, and, and what's frightening about this too, uh, Quentin, is this is not uh, a junior officer um, putting together a, a report that's unreliable. 
for whatever reason, this fellow was, and presumably still is, the detective inspector within the New South Wales Police Force. Indeed, he's the holder of an Australian Police Medal. And if this is an example of good policing, then God help us. Despite the glaring inconsistencies in the evidence, Detective Inspector Oxford's report was hailed as an outstanding and thorough investigation by a fellow police officer who was called on to review it. In your view, did the police deliberately lie? Did they simply invent a scenario that they knew was untrue? Uh, I, 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 I believe so. Uh, during the um, inquest, um, I put the submission on behalf of the family that what had occurred um, following the incident was just a, a cover-up, a whitewash that the police closed ranks and um, um, rather than in, uh, you know, face the embarrassing prospect of saying, heavens, we stuffed up, uh, a version of events was, was invented. Remarkably, the officer reviewing the police investigation recommended that all four officers involved in the fatal incident receive formal recognition for their actions in the performance of their duties. My first reaction when I heard that was disbelief. And then um, disgust. I, I find that suggestion to be abhorrent. Um, and more than that, I believe that it is a, an insult to Adam's family and to Adam's memory. The coroner at Adam Salter's inquest concluded that at best the police intervention was an utter failure. Police killed the person they were supposed to be helping. Questions are now being asked about the ability of the New South Wales Police Force to investigate its officers rigorously and impartially and there are calls for investigations of police shootings to be taken out of the hands of the police altogether, as happens in some other countries. Examples from overseas reveal that non-police are perfectly capable of doing very adequate investigations of deaths in custody. The Police Ombudsman of Northern Ireland um, is a, a civilian organisation that investigates deaths in custody, and they pride themselves on getting out there within the golden hour and collecting all of that evidence um, straight away. And they do so with the um, faith of the community. Um, the community have much higher faith in these independent investigations than the police conducting their own investigation. As the police close ranks around Sergeant Bissett and her colleagues, an inquiry has been launched by the Police Integrity Commission into how Adam Salter's death was investigated. The commissioner, Andrew Scipioni, would not be interviewed by Four Corners, citing the PIC investigation. New research from the Australian Institute of Criminology, soon to be published, will argue that the vast majority of interactions between police and people with a mental illness end constructively. But it will also reveal that 40% of those who've been fatally shot by police since 1990 including such high-profile cases as Ronnie Levy, Elijah Holcomb and Tyler Cassidy, were suffering from a mental illness. What is entirely predictable in these situations, entirely predictable, is that they will recur. If you do not have the systems in place, people will die, and it will mainly be the people with illnesses themselves or their close family members. So if you look over the last 20 years in Australia, you can find an incident in each state, in each place, in each year, where a coroner does another report, where a police does another report, where there's another state government inquiry. What is entirely predictable is if there is no serious system change to this hard end of the business, these tragedies will recur. To Officer Bissett, this man who she shot was nothing more than what she described as a schedule. Um, their response was uh, to the incident was to dehumanise somebody who had a mental illness and um, treat them in a particular way. I don't know how um, you overcome that problem, whether it's education, training um, or the like, but uh, whatever's been done so far quite clearly isn't enough. Um, and unless something is done so that officers better understand how to respond to somebody who is going through a mental crisis, then this is going to happen again. 
It's happened in the past and it will happen again. Adam Salter's death was sudden, unexpected and violent. Two years later, Adrian Salter is still struggling to come to terms with what occurred. The family hasn't pushed for Sergeant Bissett to be charged, but they do want an apology. I think it was a terrible mistake. I really, I really believe that she had I don't know, a rush of blood to the head and, and, and didn't know what she was doing and pulled out the gun instead of the taser. Um, and I don't know why the police can't just say so and say, look, we're sorry we killed your son. What's, what's so difficult about that? So far, there is no sign of an apology. In reports on fatal shootings, Adam Salter is just another unfortunate statistic. But for Adam's family and friends, his warmth and humanity will always be a cause for celebration. He was an upstanding, fine member of the community by anyone's estimation. They were, anyone would say, there's the sort of young man that we'd like to have as a citizen. He had a good job. He was well respected. He got on well with everyone. He was friendly. He had a great sense of humour. He was active and adventurous. He paid his taxes. He paid his debts. So he was looking forward to a productive life and a productive career. Um, so how I remember Adam, yeah. Uh, a great mate, a friend, and, uh, and, and uh, um, a, a son to be proud of. As we said in the story, the New South Wales Police Commissioner Andrew Scipioni declined to be interviewed. Police did provide a statement, which you can read on our website at abc.net.au.